that's good. Um, OK, hi. I'm Leonard Pantorin. That is Kai Sivas. Um, we'll do a talk about KDVS today. I will not interrupt <laughs> um, We got a lot of slides. We actually got 111. There is no <laughs> way we'll cover all of those. Um, that's completely OK. The slides um, are supposed to be just a fallback in case nobody of you has any questions. So if you have questions, totally interrupt me. And I would much prefer guiding through this um, uh, uh, presentation with your questions rather than just our slides. Um, yeah, let's get started. Um, first, who's working on this? That's Greg, who's sitting here in the first row. That's Daniel. Where did he end up? He's somewhere around here, too. I don't know where he disappeared to. Somewhere there, he hides. He's a bit shy. Um, that's me, and that's Kai Sivas, and we got a help from a couple of people, um, most prominently from Tijun, um, to get the things right in the kernel. Um, so let's get started. Um, just a little bit of an of a, um, overview of why Dbus is actually a good thing, and uh, what it actually brings to the table, why one would want that at all. So Dbus is a powerful IPC system. It brings uh, method calls from transactions. A method called transaction is basically that you, you can do a remote procedure call and you get an answer back. So the transaction is basically a request and reply. Um, there are signals. Signals are basically something where some component of the system wants to send out a signal and uh, notify other people by um, about some change. So it's, it's not, not a duplex thing. It's just a simplex thing. You broadcast something out and other people listen. And there's the concept of properties. Um, properties are basically, I mean, it's an, it's an entire O system. And properties are basically variables and objects. It exposes all of that. In the general term, it has all the O stuff that you would expect from, from an object-oriented IPC system, like classes, where, where they're actually called interfaces there. Um, but um, yeah, method calls and, and all these kind of things. Um, there's broadcasting, right? It's, it's, um, you cannot only send a message, a method call, to one person directly, or one peer directly but also to all the peers um, on the system. There's discovery. You can actually figure out what, what IPC objects and uh, what IPC services are viable on the system. Um, there's introspection. Like if you, if you discovered um, that there is some service, you can actually introspect what that actually offers, like all the message signals, objects, all these kind of things. There's policy involved, which is really important for for doing access control on, on uh, system services. So you can basically enforce that unprivileged users can execute this method, but cannot execute that other method. Then activation. Um, this is uh, basically um, a concept that uh, a service only needs to be started when it's actually used. Um, so it's about lazy activation. There's synchronization, which is a little bit more exotic feature. Um, where you, you um, can basically use the dbus service names to implement mutexes and things like that. There's type safe marshalling. Marshalling is just a word for serialization, just for packing structs in with type safety in a, into a binary stream. It's really powerful, actually. Um, there's security, so that you can actually have um, things that are enforced by, by the IPC system that cannot be faked by the sender. Um, there's monitoring, so you can actually figure out what's currently happening um, on the system, like think about the Wireshark for IPC. Yeah, that's totally possible with Dbus. Um, in contrast, traditional Unix stuff, it exposes APIs and not just streams, right? Really high level API stuff, like how we actually think when we program rather than just the building blocks. It supports passing of credentials, um, so you can actually um, pass um, security labels and use IDs, um, group IDs, PIDs over. The kernel enforces that it's actually um, the sender actually possessed those in the first place. There's file descriptor passing, so that it can actually, like in, on Unix, everything is a file descriptor, <laughs> as you might have heard, and uh, you can actually pass these around as IPC. It's language agnostic, that basically language bindings for every programming language that we support at all on Unix. Um, it has network transparency, so it cannot just uh, talk locally, but it can actually um, talk across the network. Um, there's no trust required, right? If you talk to some IPC service, you do not have to bring any kind of trust to the other side. Um, as long as you send the messages over and then carefully verify what you get back, you don't have to trust anything, which is um, a very important feature, but not an obvious one. Um, like shared memory systems usually do not have that um, thing because you have this problem that other people might change underneath why look at it, um, what you're looking at. There was somebody said something? Binder. Yeah, well, Binder has, uh, has um, 
that the, the similar concept of trust, but it's not as powerful, of, of no trust, uh, but it's not as powerful as in binder, one side has to trust the other, but the other one doesn't have to, like it's a, it's a single uh, sided trust concept, while we have this co trust concept where neither side needs to trust the other one. Um, yeah, so much about the why, why Dbus is a good thing. Uh, but Dbus has limitations. Um, Dbus is only suitable for control messages, not for payload, right? You can send, uh, like, like let's say you write a media player, it's perfectly fine to send control commands over the bus, like play the stream, stop the stream, pause, and things like that. However, to actually exchange the payload, right, like the media data that you want to play over Dbus, is so far probably not what you want to do because it's 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 high latency and it's it involves a lot of things that you probably shouldn't do. It's inefficient. Um, if you look at a at a full duplex message call transaction, right, the thing that I mentioned earlier, where you do one message call and get one transaction, uh, one message back. In classic Dbus, as we have it on our machines now that nowadays, that involves ten full copies of the message. Um, to explain that, it's basically a program uh, put together. Um, uh, it's stuff in its inside of a message, then that, so it's already one copy, then that message is copied into the kernel socket buffer, the socket buffer is copied into the dbus daemon, the dbus daemon copies into the destination socket buffer, and it's so copied out of the socket buffer to the other side. Those are five copies, and then for the answer back, you get another five. So in total, it's for, for, for every, like, there are ten message copies in place. There are four complete validations, because uh, every message has to be validated by the dbus daemon and by the receiving side, and then for the answer back, you have to get another two. And you have four context switches. Context switches in this um, case, in the sense of, of uh, context switches between processes, right? Because every time the caller needs to switch to Dbus daemon, Dbus daemon needs to switch to the destination, and for the way back, you have another two, right? Ten, four, and four. Um, the credentials one can send and receive are limited. It's only UID, PID, GID, one GID, and, uh, and uh, security label, and that's it. There's no implicit timestamping, which is sometimes really, really useful because it allows you to reconstruct um, um, ordering and because it uh, um, allows you to actually accurately say uh, when things happened. Um, it's not available in early boot, NRD, or late boot, which is particularly something that us as guys who develop system D and all the init system stuff is find really annoying because we cannot use it as IPC during the early boot phases of boot and we would much rather have something that you can use all the time. Um, the hookup with security frameworks happens in user space, like SA Linux and Upper and these kind of things um, have to be hooked up into a user space currently, which is which the security people really don't like. They would like to keep all the security decisions to the kernel um, area. Um, the activatable bus services, um, I quickly spoke about activation earlier, um, are completely independent from the from the other system services in classic DBus daemon. Um, meaning specifically, like if you have a, si a system five init system, then all the system five init scripts um, start Apache and these kind of things, but Dbus daemon is the one that starts all the Dbus um, services. So it's it's, it's completely different, completely context, uh, different context, diff completely different uh, functionality is available, and so on. Um, the code base of Dbus is a bit too baroque, and uh, it uses XML and all these kind of things. And you use a little bit. I mean, it, it was written in a time where XML was still the solution for all problems. Um, nowadays, if you try to solve something. Like a problem with, with XML, you afterwards have two problems. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, a bit less XML for very simple things would be a good idea. Um, a couple of other things like no race-free exit and idle. Uh, I mean, it's kind of an exotic feature. Just put it in there because there's so much more in there. It's basically if you do activation of a, of a service um, so that you start it only when it's needed, then you want to do the other way around too, right? That it, if it's not needed anymore, that it exits. And that's something you cannot implement race freely in Dbus. I'm not going to go in detail why that is, but with KDBus you can do that. And a couple of other things. By the way, again, if you guys have any questions, totally interrupt me. Everybody's quiet. It's weird. Okay. Um, but let's summarize. Dbus is fantastic. It solves real problems. It solves lots of things that we couldn't do before. It is a right approach. It has, uh, has good concepts. It's generic. It's comprehensive. It covers all areas. Um, it's very well established, right? It's the single most used local high-level IPC system on Linux. And it has those bindings for almost all languages that we have. Um, it is used all the way in the system, right? The, all the init systems that are, like all the modern ones at least, use it. If it's, if it's system new or if it's upstart, they all speak Dbus and nothing else. 
It's, uh, it's on the desktop, it's in embedded, it's everywhere. OK, so much about the status quo, about what Dbus daemon, like the classic Dbus does. Now let's go to the next part where we actually talk about KDBus and what it brings to the table that Dbus didn't. Still no questions? Um, so yeah, uh, KDBus is uh, suitable for large data. It's uh, gigabytes of data, actually. It, is, um, it supports zero copy, even though it won't do zero copy by default. I'll explain later why that is. Um, it's, uh, the, the, the data that you transfer is optionally reusable, so you can actually do something like you cache data and send it out a couple of times. It will not have to be copied that many times, but you can just pass the same memory area around. It's efficient. You remember those 1044 that we had on the slides earlier? In KDOS, you have two or fewer copies, right? The fewer copies is when we talk about, uh, about zero copy, but usually it will do a single copy. So you basically have one copy to get the message to the other side and one copy to get the answer back. You have two validations, right? Like if you send something to somebody else, the, that somebody else needs to verify your data to make sure that you're not trying to play games with it. And then when you get an answer back, you have to do the validation. Um, again, of, of his data. You have two context switches. You just switch once to the other side, and then you switch back for the reply. So where Divas Devon had 1044, we have two or less and two and two. Um, the credentials sent along are comprehensive. It's not just UE, PID, and GID, and it's a Linux label. It's also PID start time, the TID, like the thread ID, the COM field, which is the process name that you see on top. It's the TIDCOM, which is a thread um, name. Probably a very more exotic feature that people are not so much aware of. argv is basically the command line that you see in PS. It's X is the is the is a binary pass, the C group information like um, and what C groups are, and from that we can derive a lot of other information like to which session does something do belong to which system the unit and so on. Um, capabilities capabilities are how many of the kernel um, security checks are done these days. Well, basically a little bit finer grained version of of uh, user ID zero in a way. Um, there's audit information. There's a lot more, actually. I think we have like 35 or so different bits that you can attach to messages automatically, and the kernel will enforce them. You mentioned earlier that network transparency and these credentials. Like, is the uh, virtual machine issue? So, yeah, you ask about, um, I have to repeat the question, Sam. Um, <laughs> uh, you ask about the network transparency in relation to KDBus. The answer to that is KDBus is not tra network transparent. Dbus is, and we are compatible to Dbus. So the idea is, because we're compatible with Dbus, for the network stuff, we use the traditional Dbus protocol. For local stuff, we use this stuff that's mu much more high performant. Does that mean that these credentials and the, the strength of the Dbus? Yes, I mean, these credentials, in most cases, don't make sense to send over the other side, because, um, I don't know, UI, UID or PID only makes sense within the context of that one machine. And that's actually the case for all of that. Yeah. Any further question at this point? Um, there's implicit timestamping. Every message that is sent over, over KDBus is actually timestamped in three ways. There's a monotonic timestamp attached to it. There's like monotonic is this clock that starts at boot up and continues and continues and continues and will never jump. The user has no control. It cannot just make it uh, switch or anything like that, uh, like, like jump. It's just monotonic. There's real time, which is the wall clock time that you know timestamp. There is, uh, and then there's a counter that is uh, um, for the entire system uh, monotonically increased every time a message is sent, uh, which is an incredibly useful feature because you can, can actually order things by that, even across different buses. Um, like even if, if uh, you send one message on the system bus and one on the user bus, um, you can still know which one is the message that was sent first because that counter is actually per system and not per, per bus. Why is that useful? Why is that useful? So, so I don't know if I should wait. Why is it useful to have overall order? Well, I mean, it's, it's always um, if, if people bump messages off different buses. Um, like, for example, there's this guy called Ryan who wants to do in, in, uh, inhibition. I mean, this goes a little bit sp very specific, um, where um, he wants to proxy inhibition of the session of something that is on the, on the user bus now. Um, if you do the signal that sends out that you're supposed to suspend, um, then it's kind of nice knowing that the one from 
to the system is the one that is before the one from the session so that you know that the session is the proxy one. But this goes a little bit too much in detail. Let's talk about that later. Um, are there? Um, so the question was regarding if there are performance constraint regarding locking. So it implemented as an atomic variable, so there is no locking involved. Of course, it will do some cache things between CPUs, but it's probably not that bad. Like, like every accounting, it's not just accounting memory. Like I mean, we, we like for security reasons, all of this, like like the messages that you queue to the other side, need to be accounted for, and all these kind of things. So there are lots of counters involved, so that that if you, a rogue client cannot just um, move a lot of messages into the receiver buffer of somebody else and then um, drown it in those messages so that it cannot do anything anymore, right? So we have a lot of ac um, uh, um, accounting in place anyway, and this is just, in a way, the special form of accounting. Um, any further questions at this point? Then um, it's open for LSM because it's in the kernel. Um, LSMs like SLinux Linux and Alabama can just hook into that and do whatever they want with it. Um, Activation is identical to activation of other services, right? Because uh, because we, we ripped that out um, out of the, the traditional stuff and moved it more into a way how socket activation, I guess, works. Um, if system is used as client, all the the differences between the different kinds of activation go away. Um, you can activate something because the user wanted it, because it was activated boot, because it was activated by socket, because it was activated as uh, um, by the bus. Doesn't matter anymore. It's all streamlined the same way. The user space that we wrote is much simpler, and it does not involve XML. Um, there are a couple of other things we added, like priority queues, which is actually really useful if you do multimedia via these things, because um, uh, uh, Divas traditionally guarantees complete global ordering. And with this thing, we can kind of break this up um, so that in some areas, we allow um, non-global ordering. So that, for example, it's useful in a multimedia application where you have a data stream and where you have a control stream. And uh, usually you want to have the control messages to, to be faster than the, than the multimedia messages if, if both of them are queued at the same time. Do you implement introspectable? Introspectable? Yeah. What do you or mean? Free yeah, sure, yeah. And you say no XML? Oh, well, okay, but that's not really XML because it's, uh, we, can, we just generate it and we don't know anything about XML. We just happen to write XML tags out. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I mean, it's, it's a bit of XML that's still in there. Um, that we can, ca can't get rid of it. I mean, it's a loop and printer. It's a loop and printer, <laughs> yeah. Really read it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we don't even do, because, because function names cannot be weird, we don't even do entities or anything like that. Right? Uh, attribute values can be weird, by the way. Values, sure, but we don't. That's not included in the, in the introspection. Um, yeah, and then the race free exit on idle thing that I mentioned earlier with Katie, where you can do that. And there's more, actually. So, so much about the overview. Now I've spoken for 20 minutes. Are there any questions? Nobody question has a question. Uh, There's a question. You talk of the calls and the R GUI and uh, stuff. So, can the uh, process modify them? Or I can flash code there? Okay, so, so the, the, the question was regarding whether, whether a user space can modify this, the, the, the extra credentials and can't be attached to all the messages. Um, so they, the, the, the credentials are added in by the kernel, right? So it's not the sender who dec decides to send something. It's the kernel that adds it to, to all the messages, and user space cannot fake it. However, um, user space can change um, the com field of its own process so that the kernel will then pick that up and put in the message, right? Like the com field, like the pr process name that you see in, in the top, is something you can change with a PR control. And then the, the argv stuff is you can, like the argv variable is actually writable, and if you change the variable, it will actually show up in PS that way. And of course, the kernel will just pick that up. So um, that, that kind of stuff is not trustable. If you want to have trust, then uh, the cgroup stuff, for example, is trustable because um, cgroup changes can only be done by people who have, like, like by users who have access to the cgroup file system. So that's going to be safe. And the, the access stuff, like the binary pass, is somewhat reliable, but then people can do access to weird pass. And It'll fuck with you as well, but in general, um, yeah. If you want to have trust, you like you want to identify some some peer in a, in a trustable way so that people cannot play games with you. Then it's probably C groups what you want to use. And you said spread to that, so you tell the kernel to attach that to you and it will always be attached. Yeah. So the the API for the credential passing basically looks like when you connect to the bus, you say 
yeah, I need the timestamping imp uh, information appended to all the messages. I need the group stuff um, appended to the messages. I do not care about argv or whatever. And then the, the kernel will send you exactly that. Um, the idea is basically that, that um, we do as little as necessary, but as much as you need. Because, I mean, of course, appending all this information to all the messages ultimately can get expensive. Yes. Um, the, so the question was whether it's the receiver or the sender that decides to send these uh, that these things are sent along, and it's the receiver, right? It's not the sender. So um, I mean, for example, the capability um, credentials that are attached, we use in system itself for all our uh, Diva services to to uh, protect privileged method calls, right? Because um, I don't know, we have this daemon time date D, which is the tiny mini daemon that just is, can be used to change the local. Uh, time and it actually checks for the for the capsus time capability of the client whether that's around if it's then it allows that and if it's not it doesn't allow that so and then we have a couple of hookups like that okay so um, I basically gave an overview so far about what classic dbus did what kdbus does better um, as mentioned we have a shitload of slides and we'll not cover them but I'll um, if nobody has questions at this point I will just cover two interesting facets of how this all is implemented. Uh, which I personally at least find uh, quite interesting. Um, so the way how this actually works is um, KDBus is a, is, a, is a device node in slash dev, and you open it, and um, you get a file descriptor out of it, and then you say, I want to be a peer on the bus, and then you appear on the bus, and then you have this file descriptor, and then you can map that file descriptor, and that's your receiver buffer. And everybody s every time somebody else sends you a message, what happens actually is that that message is copied from the sender's memory into your receiver buffer. The receiver buffer is, as mentioned, always um, uh, directly linked to the file descriptor that you opened initially. So you can actually pass your bus peer FD around as much as you wish. Every everybody who maps it has access to your receiver buffer. Um, yeah. So the, the the basic concept is very, very simple. You have just have this file descriptor, and everybody just can copy directly data into that. Um, so it's single copy to destination. So it's much unlike classic sockets, where you first the sender copies something into the socket, and then the socket um, data is copied into the destination. This is single copy. You just say, I want to have this data copied into the destination buffer of somebody else. There's a, call, a concept called method call windows, um, because everything that we do is, is um, has policy applied. Um, there's a concept called method call windows, which basically means I cannot just send a message to somebody else by dropping it into the uh, sender buffer. But by doing so, I can also open a method call window that basically allows him to send something back regardless of the policy otherwise. Right? So that basically means that, um, yeah, you can configure a service that it can never send out something. <coughs> but if somebody sends a method call that is OK to it, then it can at least reply to it. Um, this, these method call windows actually um, have a timeout. So um, it basically just opens a little bit window um, in the in the policy. If that timeout is hit and the other side has not responded to that message call, um, it will be re uh, be notified about that that the timeout is hit and that the message call has failed. Um, there's a name registry in uh, KDBus which is very close to the classic DBus um, name registry. If you know that, um, it's basically name registry is, is, is for service name. So that I don't know if. Uh, if uh, systemd gets on the bus, it will say, hello, I am org.freedesktop.systemd. And then everybody who wants to talk to systemd uh, knows that systemd can be reached on org.freedesktop.systemd and will uh, send us messages to that. And the name registry is, is a relatively complex beast because it has um, all the synchronization that I quickly mentioned earlier built in, but that's probably all the way too detailed to talk about here. Um, there's kernel policy on uh, uh, what you can uh, call messages to and what you can receive signals from, which names you can own, uh, and slightly more than that. Um, here's one particularly interesting concept of, uh, of KDBus, which is MemFDs. MemFDs, as the name suggests, is about memory with a file descriptor. Um, so MemFDs are basically an area in memory that has an FD. And uh, so it's a bit like an unlinked file in slash temp, right? If you have a, uh, open a file in slash temp and immediately delete it, you have this file that you can still access via that file descriptor. But as soon as um, that file descriptor and all the duplicates it might have are closed, the file is deleted, right? MemFDs are a lot like that, but totally also in other ways not like that. And uh, 
The big thing that distinguishes them from, from these um, uh, temporary files is that you can seal them. Sealing uh, basically means that you, you say, um, this file descriptor, like, or the, 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 the memory that this file uh, descriptor refers to, is from now on not mutable anymore, right? You cannot write to it anymore, you can, cannot map anymore, you can't change the size anymore, you can rename it anymore. Um, it's muta uh, immutable. And uh, this sealing something, uh, sealing a, a memory of D, you can only do if you are the only one with a reference to it, and if you do not have, uh, have it mapped, right? Um, then you can, uh, the idea of these MFDs are basically that you can drop huge amounts of data in them, and then take the uh, memory FD and send it over KD bus to the other side so that the other side has a file descriptor. Then it can map that file descriptor and access it. But because it's immutable, the sender cannot change it and the receiver cannot change it so that they, they cannot play games with each other. Because uh, one, one security issue is always if the sender can still modify the data that has been received by the receiver um, and the receiver tries to parse it and it changes under the, the, the parsing routines and, and confuses. Um, the center. So it's absolutely essential that this ceiling thing happens so that the, both the center and receiver can be sure that the other side doesn't play games with this. The reason why we added MAMFDs is uh, to implement zero copy data transfer. So um, the, the client library that we wrote, that lives, lives in the system repositories, will actually, every time it puts the message together, do that in, in one of these MAMFDs. And then when it, uh, these MAMFDs um, grow beyond a certain threshold, it will send these MAMFDs as a file descriptor over to the other side. So it will seal it, take the file descriptor, um, tell KDBus, please give this file descriptor to the other side. The other side gets the file descriptor, maps it again, has access to the data. However, if it's below this um, specific threshold, then instead the data will just be copied to the other side and no fancy MAMFD stuff is being done. Um, this threshold um, is uh, we, we picked as the threshold where copying uh, things is faster, like uh, below the threshold copying things um, in memory is faster than actually giving the file descriptor to the other side and having it mapped there. The reason for that is that memory mapping file descriptors, if you have them, is actually really, really expensive. Um, the threshold we have measured on a, quite a few different CPUs from, from x86 to, to old 32-bit um, um, x86, ARM, and PowerPC. And interestingly, we always came to, to the same um, threshold where um, like below which copying memory is actually faster than, than doing the memory mapping um, stuff. The reason why it's so expensive is because TLBs and all these kind of ne things need to be cached. The, the CPUs are simply not optimized for, for mapping things and unmapping things very quickly. They are optimized for copying things very quickly. Um, the threshold is actually by a tr a 512K usually, right? So um, up to, if you want to transfer 512K, up to that level it's faster to just copy it to the other side than to actually do any memory mapping stuff. Um, the MAMFDs are, as I described just with this, where the messages are put together in the MAMFDs, are something that is transparent to the user of KDBus, right? It doesn't know that it will actually be placed in MAMFD. It doesn't know whether it's now copied or whether it's sent uh, as a, a file descriptor, and it doesn't have to know. It's completely abstracted by that library. However, the MAMFD concept is also viable for applications to use for whatever they want to use it, um, which can be quite a bit of interesting stuff. Like, for example, as you might know, I've wrote Pulse Audio before. In Pulse Audio, we have this concept of a sample cache. Right? A sample cache is something where you upload um, uh, some, some sample data, and then it, it hangs around there, and it can be reused a couple of times. So like, for example, it's, it's for all these annoying event sounds that you have where you, the machine clicks um, if, you, if you click with your mouse and these kind of things. Because you reuse them all the time, you just want to cache them once and reuse them, reuse them, and reuse them. The MAMFD stuff um, makes that relatively um, useful easy to do because you can actually place all these samples in a MAMFD and then every time you want to play that you can just pass the MAMFD, the data around it again and again and again and uh, you don't have to put anything together anymore, you can just reuse the stuff. Any question to MAMFDs? So, uh, I mean, um, they, they, they are freed when you, uh, so the question was when MAMFDs are, uh, are um, freed. Um, so um, MAMFDs are free when you close them, and we close them um, basically, like if you, we send it over to the other side, um, the other side closes it when it's done with it. Yes, it is basically like with any other file script. Um, uh, uh, 
So the question is whether you can MMFDs without using KDBus. Um, so um, the MMFDs are currently viable through the dev KDBus uh, um, device node, um, but um, the API is completely separate from, from um, uh, 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 KDBus otherwise, so it's a, just an implementation detail that is actually sits there. For us, it makes a lot of things easier because we actually need to know that something is a MMFD so that we can enforce a couple of things there. But uh, then again, Ryan is interested at least to expose uh, MMFDs as a high-level concept in glib and in gbytes. But um, Ryan is more interested to have this in a generic way rather than attached to KDBus. I'm not sure I agree with that um, feeling, but uh, that desire. But uh, anyway, yeah. Um, how much time do I have? 15 minutes. Um, this concept of MFTs is not something completely new. It's, it's something that, that Android has with Ashram. Uh, the Ashram semantics are a little bit different, though. Um, what, is, what is really nice about our MFTs is that when you, when you seal it, then neither you can change it nor the other side can change it anymore. So, so you have this um, two-sided trust relationship. Like, they don't need to trust you. You don't need to trust them. Um, the, 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 the memory that is um, referenced by the MFT is completely uh, immutable to both of them. And Ashram, there's only a way in one direction, right? You, when you send, like when you put some memory together and send that to somebody else, you will always retain um, write access to that, and it's only the other side that cannot um, write to it or, or manipulate it anymore. Can you seal and unseal if the only mapping is a read-only one? So the question was if you can seal or unseal if the um, only mapping is read-only one. Currently, no, because the, we at least or Kai at least didn't couldn't figure out how we can actually figure out if it's only read-only mapping of the MFD. That's uh, easy. Okay, so um, that's one of the facets that I like detecting details that I wanted to cover. Another one that I wanted to cover is uh, how signal broadcasting works in, in, in KDBus. Signal broadcasting, of course, is a thing where you send the message that you want, let's say, you want to notify everybody that some new hardware is, is, has been found and you send that broadcast signal out. Um, however, not everybody's actually interested in that message, right? Like if, if I'm a word processor, I don't really care about whether there's a new hardware available or not. So um, what's essential is, so even though this is broadcast to everybody, that everybody needs to be able to install a filter so that it's not waked up by any, every single message that is sent on the system. Um, to make this happen, we we're making use of Bloom filters. Bloom filters are, are like it's computer science. You can look up the details about what's, what, what, um, uh, how they're defined on, on Wikipedia. Basically, a Bloom filter is, a, is an array of bits, and um, it allows you to test very quickly if, uh, if this if a certain word is included in a vocabulary. So um, just to, to, to give an explanation, an example, um, how this is used, Google, um, when you type something into the search field of Google, it will um, use the Bloom filter to first check if the word that you typed in is, <coughs> is actually available in the entire vocabulary of things that, that Google has indexed. Now, the Bloom filters are probabilistic, right? They will they will tell you it's probably in there, but um, it, so it knows false positives where it will say it might be in there where it isn't, but it does not know false negatives, right? If it says it's not in there, then it's definitely not in there. We use these bloom filters in a, in a way that we actually include a bloom filter in every single broadcast message that is sent. And then the kernel, like, like if somebody wants to su subscribe to somebody, uh, to, 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 to these broadcast messages, it just installs a mask to this Bloom filter for its local connection, right? And what the kernel then simply does, it matches that mask against the Bloom filter, and if it matches, then it lets it through. This means that this way you can efficiently su subscribe to messages and only those messages that you're interested. You might, however, get 
a couple of more messages than you expected. So you need to be able to deal with that. So it's, it's always just the first step of filtering things. Um, it, you must always have a second step where you actually check if it's really the data that you have. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a really interesting thing. It's not the first time we, we did this with KDBus. We, we already did that before with, with Libudev. Um, Libudev is this library that probably everybody of you uses um, to, to get device notifications so far. Um, and it uses the exact same thing. Um, it's, it's an exciting little thing. So, yeah, every broadcast message includes a Bloom filter that is calculated by the sender. It contains all supported matches. Like, it's basically the, the, the vocabulary contains every single match formulated in a word that other people could subscribe to. And then the kernel will simply check the receiver Bloom filter mask against this Bloom filter that's included, right? Um, yeah, it's an, it's an awesome thing. Um, the Bloom filter uses, uh, like, it's how Bloom filter actually works is that there's a couple of hash functions that are uh, used on the words and that then are re correspond to specific bits in the Bloom filter. What we use there, just as an implementation detail, is zip hash. Um, but ultimately, the kernel doesn't even care about all the hashing and how the Bloom filter is built. That's completely left to user space. All that the kernel does is um, it, uh, it, it masks basically one uh, bit mask against the bit, ma uh, bit filter, basically, the, the, the array there. I'm sorry, come again? Um, so the question was whether, whether a, a, a rogue process can uh, cause a denial of service with this. I don't see how. Why? Uh, because you can, you, can, you can change your own um, um, uh, filter mask, and you can set all the bits in the fil filter mask, which, which basically mean send me all the broadcast messages. And then you will be flooded, but it's only going to be you who's flooded. So, yeah, sure. But I mean, the the, the of course, yeah. I mean, the, this is the the Bloom filter. To make this very very clear, is not a security technology. It can't be because it's probabilistic. It is a technology to suppress wake ups, right? To make sure that if, if, if I have my laptop and somebody sends a message, not everything has to wake up, but only the processes that, 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 that um, are most likely the ones that <laughs> will actually make use of it. Right? So it's, it's about power efficiency. It's not about security. Any further questions at this point in time? <laughs> so I <laughs> think... Oh, down there. Are you So, um, uh, because we had this discussion with Ryan before, we actually um, um, made sure that we can upgrade the Bloom filter at any time. So if this actually happens, we could tiny way um, uh, change how we hash things, and this would go away. Yeah, but but also, they are very unlikely, right? Yeah, um, So, of course, you, you can construct something like that. Um, but the only thing is that happens is that the power consumption goes bad. And it's very unlikely, because um, the way we, we selected the parameters for the Bloom filter, we said, OK, we want the likeliness that um, such a clash happens to be under um, uh, 0.0.01% uh, 0 .0 or something like that. And then, yeah, sure, you can, you can, you can, uh, you can use that to, to worsen the yeah, CPU. You increase the number of hashes. Exactly. Usually you do two or three hashes. Done. Yeah. Anyway. So you have to collide three well, which the effect is, is just to push down the, 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 the probability of a clash like that. But the, I mean, just by birthday paradox, it seems like you're going to get two things eventually. And then you're stuck in this sort of behavior for a long time that you can, you can, you can count it at frustration time when every client is suggested that. You just increase K in the Bloom So we notice that on Fedora, we have like some services that are sharing the same hash. Well, if so you we you just but you know, it's a little bit like this discussion like, oh my god, everybody uses UIDs now and they're random and there could actually be conflicts. But I mean, they're, they're, they're less likely to have conflicts than. Oh, yeah, you're much more likely to collide these. They, these are li more likely to collide than, than, than uh, UIDs. But the thing is, UIDs are actually, they have a lot of value. Our stuff doesn't have a lot of value. Everything that happens here is that the power consumption goes a little bit higher because more processes wake up. Uh, 
Um, uh, so the question was regarding uh, CPU handling, like if you do a massive call, what would happen with the CPU? So microkernel operating systems usually do this thing where, where if you do a massive call, then uh, um, actually the CPU is passed while you hang in the massive call and, and wait for it to complete in the synchronous massive call. You actually pass the CPU's time slice to the other side. We don't do that. Um, however, um, uh, the reason why we don't do that is not because we don't want to, but simply because it's uh, much more uh, uh, complex to get the patch accepted then. Uh, because it involves all the scheduler people to, to, to s uh, sign off on that. We added um, uh, quite a bit of uh, functionality to, to the API. Like, for example, there's an IOCTL actually for doing synchronous method calls, which basically um, will allow implementation of this, right? There are two things that we are interested in there. Like, first of all, we want this thing that the time slice is actually gifted uh, to the destination, so so that yeah, you stop being scheduled, but it's not somebody else who's being scheduled, but it's actually the the other side that's immediately being scheduled. And the other side is uh, the other thing that we're interested in is actually priority inheritance. Um, priority inheritance basically means that 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 if you run at at um, high um, scheduling um, privileges, like a real time process or something like that, and you invoke a method on some other daemon that is not um, real time privileged, and then while you do that. You actually pass your real-time privileges to the other side. So anyway, the, the API that we designed makes all of this possible, but it's always going to be just a hint thing, right? Like um, the kernel can make use of the fa functionality or not. Um, but yeah, we open up the doors, but we do not implement that right now. Maybe eventually we do. The microkernels do. I think it might be good for us if we did it as well. So yeah, these are the other <laughs> 100 slides that I have. Um, if you guys are interested, then uh, uh, we can totally um, uh, uh, talk about that outside. Um, if you if you Google for KDBS, like the KDBS user space that we did lives in the systemd repository um, for a couple of reasons, because we use activation for systemd and because we want to reuse the code and because we believe it should be part of the basic building block you build an operating system from, which is what how we define systemd these days. The code is all out there. Um, this is basically the last slide I will show. Um, the, code, uh, the, the code for the kernel side is in the KDBus git. The code for the user space side is in the systemd git. Um, you have to enable it, however, in systemd currently with a compile time switch. The reason for that is because we want to make sure that at this point in time, no distribution accidentally enables that uh, because we want to still have the, the, the ability to change the IPI slightly if we feel so, right? Later on, this will be, of course, enabled by default. Um, we hope to get KDBus reviewed and accepted into the kernel in 2014. Um, uh, the, we have uh, Greg on our side, so we have a hope that it might run <laughs> somewhat smoothly. Then again, the two previous tries of, of getting DBus into the kernel have failed um, grandiosely. So, but we hope it will go sm smooth. I mean, when we got reviews from Tijun and people like that, so who, who generally trusted in the Linux community, so we kind of hope that. I don't have URLs there. Google for the Git repos if you're interested. In the system you, uh, Git repo, you will actually find a technical um, text. It's terse. It's not, it will not tell you all the details, but it will give you an overview in much more detail than what I just did you about the Bloom filters, about the MemFDs, about all these kind of things, about everything else that's in there. If you want to know more, I recommend um, having a look at that. Uh, if you have any further questions, um, I think my time's over, or is it actually? Okay, we have three minutes for more questions. It currently is. Um, the question was whether you can build it as a module in the kernel, and yes, because we need to debug it, and it would not be fun if we always had to reboot. So. <laughs> <laughs> so are you going to under the migration for existing libraries? So um, you already saw that there. Currently, so so we I didn't talk too much about user space here. We implemented that in systemd. Um, there's a new library, dbus library, called libsystem systemd dbus. We wrote that because um, the existing lib dbus is a clunky p beast. And it's not fun hacking against that. And I mean, and the lib dbus d guys know that, like, if you look at the documentation, basically says, you're not supposed to use this library directly. Please use some higher level thing. And yeah, but um, we needed a library that is OM safe and all these kind of things, which means that we cannot use uh, g dbus and, and things like that, even though that's probably the better way. Um, so we have this new library, which is low level. It's really nice to use. We spend a lot of time getting the API right. It's probably not what you want to write your high level application with, but it's absolutely what you want to write your, your system service with, your system tools, and, and these kind of things. Um, then the the two other relevant, like big, famous 
very used libraries are the one from dbus from old libdbus and there's gdbus ryan is going to port the um, together with uh, some people from samsung which are around here somewhere i think somewhere there um uh, like mm, Ryan is going to shepherd that stuff into GD, into glib, into gdbus, so that um, gdbus will natively speak kdbus. Um, in libdbus, also the Samsung people are working on that um, uh, to make sure that the classic libdbus can also speak this um, stuff. And then it, whether dbus daemon or kdbus is used underneath is mostly relevant for applications. There are some differences. Those differences we try to document if you look into the system we get. Um, that almost all applications should not care except for the system level software because we changed all the policy around because the old policy is over, my time is over. But anyway, in the meantime, there's a proxy which actually provides compatibility with the old protocol so that everything just works. This is the end of my talk. Thank you very much. If you have questions, ask me a question. <laughs>